What I find to be one of the most fascinating subjects in philosophy is the idea of necessity, that which must be. Now, what do you mean by something that must be? Are you talking about a deterministic universe in which everything is just simply falling dominoes? No, I'm, I'm not putting it that way. My uh, view of necessity comes from my epistemology. My epistemology starts with the cogito. It starts on the inside. Um, I exist, I have perceptions, those perceptions are sometimes uh, perceptions that I like and sometimes they are not perceptions that I like and sometimes they are perceptions that I actively dislike. <clears throat> so far so good. I think most people kind of agree with this. I'm not sure that people would start their epistemology where I do, but I, I get it. Uh, there are other ways to look at reality than strictly internal or perceptual. Um, now, what I'm referring to here, however, is the idea of, I guess, an epistemological necessity. Necessity at the very basics of our, um, our view of things, our perceptions. In my view, necessity is, right now, in this instant, I'm looking into a webcam. That cannot be altered. It's a fact. It can't be altered, at least right now. I can alter it in a few seconds. I can reach up and knock the uh, the webcam off my um, monitor. But right now, in this instant, it's there. And it's going to stay there um, in this instant. I live in a universe where things don't just suddenly fly out of place or whatever. Um, the fact that that webcam is sitting in front of me, about a foot uh, in front of my eyes, is necessity. It's there. Now, that doesn't mean that it had to be there a week ago, and it doesn't mean that it has to be there a week from now. What I am saying is, in this instant, it is necessary that it's there. Everything that comes at you at the level of perception is, in my opinion, necessity. In other words, necessity is the snapshot of the instant of perception. And I would say even before cognition takes place, necessity is that which you're, you perceive directly in front of you. Even if it isn't real, it may be necessity um, or necessary to assume that it's real because you simply can't ignore it. You can't just pretend like it's not there. I'm reminded of um, Krishna's injunction to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, in the despondency of Arjuna, Arjuna sort of collapses inward and can't handle the fact that he's going into this titanic battle where he's going to kill his relatives. Um, <clears> he <throat> says, this is too horrible. And Krishna, in essence, says to him, Arjuna, look where you are right now. This battle is going to happen, with or without you. Do you understand that? Never mind what, how things should be. This is how things are. That's necessity, right? Um, if Arjuna wanted to look back and sort of see the twists and turns of his fate or how things panned out in reality, uh, he might be able to sort of explain how he got there, but it doesn't alter the fundamental necessity of his situation. The necessity of the matter is he's there, he's standing on his chariot, he's got to do something about that, and there's massive armies arrayed against each other, and he's a commander of one of those armies. He's stuck with it. That's just the way it is. Any time to sort of rebel against this possibility was is now gone, even if it was five minutes ago. You're there now. You have to react to it. Which is kind of interesting. Like I've heard it described this way, that, that Krishna telling Arjuna what necessity is, is sort of a dialogue that takes place at the very heart of anything that ever happens to anybody, ever. Necessity is where you are now, is what you see now. You may have caused it all, but there's no reason for you to say that this was absolutely inevitable, I suppose, or that it's anyone's fault. Because the only time that you can actually invoke any sort of volition is in the present moment. 
I can't alter the past, and I can't alter the future, if it truly is the future. Um, <clears throat> that's Epictetus, right? There are things that are in your control and things that are not in your control. Um, I can't control what other people think. I can't control the fact that I'm on Earth. I can't control the fact that Donald Trump is president. I can't control the fact that all these things I'm stuck with, at least in this instant. <clears throat> But I seem to be able to have some control over it, over how I perceive it. Um, but again, I'm not saying that there is free will, and I'm not saying that we live in a purely determined universe. I'm simply, I, th I find the free will versus determinism thing to be sort of an incomplete or a very misleading dichotomy. Um, I think that uh, it has more to do with how Epictetus describes it, that which is in your control and that which is not in your control or that which is unavoidable and that which is alterable. Um, now, what interests me in this is um, how it may impact certain ideas um, that are presently being discussed um, in you know, this group or this thread or whatever. Um, solipsism. Now, how do you deal with solipsism? I would say that solipsism is only sort of to be transcended as opposed to refuted, because I don't think one can refute it. But again, I, I don't require the three logical, um, three classic rules of logic, um, identity, non-contradiction, and the excluded middle. I don't mind apparent contradictions. Um, I don't mind... Um, apparent um, inconsistencies or in, uh, inherent half-truths or whatever, or apparent half-truths rather. None of this bothers me. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter ultimately if I am a brain in a vat um, because the reality that I deal with, the necessity of it all seems to indicate that brain in the vat or not, the impulses that I'm being fed from the outside world matter to me. It goes to the whole idea, or the heart of the idea of an epistemology for relativism. One gets the impression in quote-unquote relativism, which I'm I don't really subscribe to, that someone is arguing the universe out of existence, that someone is saying that we can't know anything, we can't discuss anything, we might as well forget about it all. Um, no, because when you look at solipsism in a certain way, it does seem to sort of transcend itself, because even if I am a brain in a vat, that implies an external reality in which there is a physical brain in a physical vat. Um, in that sense, solipsism transcends itself. Um, the necessity is there is a brain sitting there in a vat that is, cr that is subject to all of these illusions and impulses, that it is being fed by who knows what. Um, it's, you know, it, you end up just in a sort of turtles all the way down sort of situation or infinite regression or whatever. Um, all you can do is just sort of continually widen your perspective. So when you're looking at things from multiple points of view, it, you can do that to your heart's content, but you cannot ignore necessity. Because even if that which is necessary, even if it isn't real, it's still necessary. Um, <clears throat> you know the old um, subject in a lot of science fiction. If I'm in the Matrix and I have the wires plugged into the back of my neck and somebody punches me in the face in the Matrix, will my body start to bleed in real life? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if I believe that I'm killed in one of my dreams, do I actually die? Who know, how, how, do, how would we answer that? Um, people die in their sleep all the time, I suppose, um, but I don't really see how we could actually determine 
what that person was dreaming at the time of their death. There's no way to falsify that. So, even if you're a brain in a vat, you're still subject to necessity. You're still not subject to things that seem mightily real. The thing is, you don't have any means of proving this to anybody else. But that's okay, in my view of things. I, I'm okay with the fact that I can't conclusively demonstrate to somebody else even the fact of my own existence. Um, this sort of flies in the face of the scientific method, I suppose, but I'm not rejecting the scientific method. It depends on what you want to employ it for. If you're looking for a certain result, the scientific method is as they say, your man. That's what you want to do. If you want you want to get a certain result that you can then use to the mutual advantage of someone else and yourself, then yes, you need to be able to communicate about it. But the problem with falsifiability and the scientific method and stuff like that is it's all strictly external. It's only um, intersubjective or interpersonal really or I what would I say interconscientious in between two consciousnesses assuming of course that such things exist assuming there isn't just one big consciousness out there now that's okay again because all that we're looking for is a result we're not looking for a truth claim but I think a lot of people who sort of assume that we have reality figured out when in fact I don't think we have a lot of people sort of say, well, there, the scientific method is the best way to describe everything because we can replicate the results, we can falsify things, etc., etc. But there is an enormous amount going on in terms of our experiences that isn't falsifiable. Um, what do you do about that? What do you do about necessity? Arjuna was standing on the chariot surveying the arrayed armies at Kurukshetra and let's say that he was a brain in a vat that all of this was a massive illusion but a very good one would it really matter whether or not there was some sort of external reality to it all from his perspective well he may be having an illusion or something like that perhaps but perhaps everything is an illusion right are, are you prepared to stare solipsism square in the face as opposed to just saying it's a dead end so I'm not going to think about it um, I would say that it doesn't really matter because Arjuna has existed in a certain reality up until the moment of the present and the present the necessity inherent in presentness hasn't changed. He's, he can trace it all the way back as far as his mind will go and he can see the events that led up to this moment where he's standing there um, in a battle he doesn't bloody well want to be in. Doesn't matter if that's real or not. Um, it doesn't matter if um, it's falsifiable or not. From the perspective of Arjuna, this is as real as it gets. And it can't get any realer than this because we're talking about the experiential. <clears throat> so what does this do to ideas of free will versus determinism? Um, as I say, I'm kind of a non-cognitivist on the whole thing because in some cases free will and determinism end up in a sort of, I wouldn't even call it compatibilism, they seem to end up in some sort of synthesis because the internal is in my control, the external isn't. The internal is me, is my reaction to the external, that's all. The external is there. I might not know exactly what it is, and I might not be able to agree with everybody else exactly what it is. But from the lo from the uh, perspective of my experiences, it's real, and experience is all I have. So you you don't necessarily have to disprove or refute solipsism. 
um, if you take into consideration the idea of necessity, the idea of perception in the moment of perception. Um, I don't think I can disprove anything in the moment. I don't think I can somehow deny that I'm staring into the webcam because every ounce of evidence that I have says that it is happening right now. Um, whether or not it is happening is irrelevant at this moment. So necessity and solipsism and free will determinism, and I would even say things like atheism versus theism or whatever, um, essentially means to act or not to act, or to believe, or I shouldn't say believe, but act in accordance with necessity, or not act in accordance with necessity. Arjuna had the option of not acting in accordance with necessity. He dropped his weapons and fell down, and you know, sank down in his chariot and sat there and despaired. That's refusing to act in accordance with necessity. We can do it. Um, you ever seen someone in a state of severe depression? Is that in, in many ways that person simply cannot get sort of in sync with necessity. They are overwhelmed by the reality of the present instant. So what would be freedom in that case? What would be the closest we can get to free will, I would assume that that would be when you are acting in accordance with necessity. In Epictetus' sense, you are acting in accordance with that which you cannot control. Here's Nietzsche. Artists have here perhaps a finer intuition. They who know only too well that precisely when they no longer do anything arbitrarily and everything of necessity their feeling of freedom, of subtlety, of power, of creatively fixing, disposing, and shaping reaches its climax. In short, that necessity and freedom of will are then the same thing with them. Now there's elements of amor fati in there, right? If I make it my own, I have, you know, or if I love something, I have made it my own. If I don't just accept my fate, which apparently is what Epictetus would have us do, but according to Nietzsche, love your fate, then you haven't simply said, this means nothing to me and it won't affect me. You're actually taking control of it. If you act strictly in accordance with necessity, you become utterly free. That was the paradox of the Bhagavad Gita, of course. Krishna was trying to get Arjuna to see how necessity and whatever feelings, experiences, shall we say, experiences of freedom, of happiness, of joy, of ataraxia, uh, you have can be meshed together, where you can be in a state of ataraxia, to use the Western term, the closest thing the, we, the ancient Greeks had to our word happiness, which is kind of misleading, but anyway. You are at your best. You are at your best and your most, um, or I am at my best and most myself, I guess is a better way to describe it because I'm talking about the perceptual level here. When I am acting freely and lovingly in accordance with necessity. Now that's all very well to say this, but I can f I can think of few things more difficult to actually pull off. How do you love what is ne necessary all the time? Um, Nietzsche Nietzsche goes to far, so far as to say that he believes that that's the model for human greatness: is your ability to love that which is necessary. And again, that's what the Gita says. Arjuna is, uh, is told, love your fate. You were born into the warrior caste, go be one. Um, I know it's not nice that you have to do all these horrible things, but you have to do these horrible things. That's necessity. Um, <clears throat> and you have to understand necessity 
at the perceptual level, not at the external kind of level. I'm talking about the level where things are coming at you in real time right now. Um, to revisit an old metaphor, imagine that your perception of time is viewed from the point of view of someone inside of a moving car going up a street. Normally we're looking backward through the rear window of the car watching reality go by us like this. That is a form of cognition that is heavily anchored in the past and the present really isn't so important. True perception would be if you turned your head around and looked over the driver's shoulder through the windshield and saw things coming right at you without any um, anchors from the past to make any sense of it. That is pure perception. That to me is necessity. That which you experience at the experiential level, if I dare say such a thing, is necessity. I'm not saying that, you know, that you can't sort of warp this if you want to. You can say, well, this is necessary, so I'm going to do it as a sort of a rationale for what you're planning on doing, where you've put an idea together. But your input is not necessity itself. Your input is your ego. So <clears throat> the ego is not external to me. The ego is part of what I am, or arguably, at least the ego is internal. It's not taking place outside of whatever I happen to be the totality of what I happen to be. Um, so you've got necessity and you've got a desire to be free. I think that these two can be made to be made to work in synthesis and I think this is what, what Nietzsche implies. He's not talking about compatibilism here. He's talking about desire and necessity acting in complete harmony to the point where they are one and the same thing. Again, a massively tall order, but again, didn't he say that's what greatness is? <laughs>